and welcome. Very happy today to be joined by Corey Sterling, who is a lawyer, small business owner, group fitness instructor, and a yoga teacher. He wrote the Yoga Law Book and has served hundreds of clients in the health and fitness space all across the world, the majority of whom own uh, or operate a fitness health studio. He has presented at conferences around the world, teaching about the law in a fun and practical way. And he won the award for highest rated session at Mind Body Bold in 2019, amongst the field of the health and fitness leading minds and best presenters. So, Corey, welcome. Thanks for being on the Integral Yoga podcast today. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be chatting. Cool. Um, so I like to dive right in with this question. I'm a deeper question, but what matters to you? I'd say the, the first thing that comes to mind, feeling good matters to me. Hmm. Feeling good and choosing better feeling thoughts matter to me. And I, and I think the, the idea behind that, for a while now, sort of I've, um, I've lived a life uh, where I've made a lot of decisions that have sort of either gone against the grain or the, are different than other decisions than, than the typical, you know, professional in a field or person in a situation would make. And I always believe that if I'm doing the things that feel good for me, I'll be the best version of myself, which will enable me to help as many people as possible. So that's... Mm. Yeah, that's my answer. Yeah. So that could be a little tricky, I think, too, sometimes, or at least for myself, like sorting that out of, you know, doing what feels good f for me, right, can be maybe viewed as like a selfish thing or like a not, a, a not, not a good practice in life. Like, why should I be doing, you know, what's good for me instead of kind of focusing more on, you know, what's good for, for other people. Um, but, you know, perhaps, you know, you come to an understanding that if I'm not feeling good myself and taking care of my own being, I'm not going to be of very much use to other people. So is that the conclusion that you've come to? And it has it taken some time for you to kind of process all of that? The hardest, the hardest part of all of that is mm, shifting the paradigm around how we use the, use the word selfishness or selfish, which seems to have all of these negative connotations where it's sort of like zero, zero sum. If you're using the word selfishness, that means that's at the exclusion of other people benefiting or other people receiving something if you're putting yourself first. And I'm okay with being selfish. At age 34, I'm cool to say to say that. And I would say all of the work has probably been around being able to switch that mindset and that position where I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable saying that I'm selfish in that regard. And what I can tell you, the proof is in the pudding that the more selfish I am, the better everything is for everyone around me, the better I'm able to serve my clients, the better, the better friend I'm able to be. When I show up, I really show up. And if I don't show up, it's because it doesn't feel right in that particular moment. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the founder of Integral Yoga, Swami Satchidananda, you know, he, he talked about this and, and specifically about a person maintaining their peace being kind of the highest priority in life. That for me to focus on uh, my own peace and staying peaceful uh, in a way can be seen as a selfish thing if I'm focused on that the most, but will lead to serving others uh, ultimately. So it may, maybe that's, that's similar to feeling good too, I would say. You know, feeling peaceful, I think is a pretty good feeling uh, when we're experiencing that. Yeah, I, th I think they can be synonymous in that context of feeling good, what's important, choosing, because I think when I feel good, then I'm at peace because that inner struggle is not present, which, you know, the, the absence of that struggle can, can in, in, it, we're sort of talking about a couple of different things that are really sort of the same thing, right? Just using different words of better feeling thoughts or peace or, or whatever. But I think the general idea of putting yourself first and understanding that once you put yourself first, um, you can be the best, best service to everyone around you. I'm a firm believer in that. And can it also be seen as putting yourself first when you're helping other people too, right? Like as an example, I think, you know, I've heard that, 
one of the recommendations when someone is kind of going through a difficult time is to go out uh, and serve someone else, right? Do some volunteer work, do, do whatever it is that benefits other people. And then right away, that has the effect of making you feel better. So even when we serve other people, can that in a way be seen as something that serves the self? And maybe that's a, a good outlook look to have when we, when we do that. For sure. I think there, there can be altruistic aspects to it, but coming back to the simplicity of it and not trying to make it something more complex than it is. So you asked me what matters to me and I said, feeling good or cho- you know, choosing better feeling thoughts. Does it happen sometimes that the thoughts that I feel are things that benefit other people? A lot of the time, like I, I work, I've, I work with a team. We have a wonderful team and all of us work together. So if I only always did the things that I thought were, you know, yeah, I think we just need to dissociate selfish action from doing things that are only for yourself. Um, and instead consider that if you're, uh, you know, a, a rounded person with a, a moral compass, make, making those, you know, it's, it certainly is in the realm of possibility that the things that you'll decide to do will be, will benefit others. And that can also be the thing that feels good for you in the moment. Yeah. Nice. What's it like having a, a team? Having a team, having a team is it all like, every, look, what, what I'm, what I've learned about my life is that it, you, I'm learning, I'm constantly learning how to do all these different things. Right. And I think what I've learned about a team is that a team is it's a tremendous amount of work because you want to see the people on your team. You want to support them. You want to see them grow. That For me, that comes from a very innate and natural position of like loving the people I work with, feeling a responsibility that they're working, you know, that they're spending their energy and time working with conscious counsel. I think it's a little bit scary having a team because you assume this responsibility of wanting people to have a positive experience and, and growth. But if I, if I could distill having a team into one sentiment, it would be you can accomplish so much more with a team than you can on your own. It is crazy. <laughs> but you can, for a long time, I was like a lawyer, sole practitioner. I, was, I did sales. I did drafting. I did, I did everything. And it was awesome. And I learned a lot. But in having a team and having a growing team, you realize how much more can be accomplished when you work with others. And I think as the manager slash leader, I've, there's a lot of responsibility and effort and energy that comes with that. But the goal should be working with people who you love so that you your inspiration is genuine. And like when you love the people you work with, you want to see them succeed for themselves as well as for the, the common goal. And um, and yeah, and. And it's hard because like sometimes you have a disagreement with your team and you're not sure how to how to handle a situation and you think, oh, it would be so much easier if it was just me. But I don't know. It's, it's probably like having a young child, right? You have a one, one and a half year old. Yeah. How old? Yeah. It, it's sort of like having a team is like having a family. Is it it requires more effort and less, you know, selfishness and doing things for others. But the reward is incredible and in what you can accomplish and your life is so much more. Is that right? So I, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's like th- these situations uh, that we find ourselves in, right? It's not so like black and white I- I- in life. There's, um, you know, there's pros and cons. And, and ultimately, you know, we have to assess and say, you know, did the pros of this situation outweigh the cons? But to think that there aren't going to be any, you know, difficulties or challenges or whatnot is unrealistic. I mean, everyone, I think, understands that about, you know, having a relationship. You have a relationship with another person and you give up something, you know, you give up your individuality uh, to a certain degree, you know, but what are you gaining, you know, is is the question. So when maybe we hit these, you know, uh, you know, rocky places, you know, I'll say as an example, you know, my daughter wakes up, you know, in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, (laughs) you know, am I wanting to like wake up and and go and get her and, and do all of that? Like not particularly, but I mean, with her, especially as an example where it's not even a question whether or not the pros outweigh like the challenges there. 
and and so it's wonderful. So it's I'm I'm glad to hear you talking that way about a, a team, and and I totally agree from my experience. It's like, you know, it's been a little bit of a process, like moving away from feeling that I need to try to do everything myself, right, or that that I'm capable of of of, of doing everything well, like just become so clearly unrealistic. You know, I have certain things that I can do well and everyone, everyone brings something else to the table. So a team is a beautiful thing to, to kind of assess and, and realize and uh, help others, you know, come into what they're interested in. And, and that makes the whole team stronger, I think. Right. Yeah, it, it does. And, and the other thing that, that I, you know, reflecting on the, this idea of team, something that I, I say, we have monthly, we have monthly meetings at Conscious Council. And one thing I say every time, and like the best part is like, I really genuinely believe this. It's like what I say to the team every time is I would not want to do this with anyone else. Like as it, it's like, we are a unit and we are moving towards our goal. And then we achieve a goal and we set another goal further down. And we're, But it's like the whole fun of it is doing it together. And the fact that we started, we started as a team when we were all the way back there and we just continually progress. And like, that's the whole point is like, at this point, if I could hire brand new people who were super professional and whatever, all experts in their field, I wouldn't because that's not, the fun is the co-creating together and the fun is being part of a team. And like, at the end of the day, when we look back on everything we accomplished, like we did this as a unit and, um, and that excites me. Nice. You mentioned progress there what's your outlook on on progress in general you know for for your company right because i think when we set goals we say okay like i'm only looking at this goal you know and that's the top of the mountain and then, and and i want to get there um but then as you mentioned you know if you do get there then then now what and that can sometimes be be confusing i think sometimes n- not knowing what to do once you achieve your goals or so this idea of maybe instead that you're bringing up is like never ending progression, right? Or like on the individual level of life too, like, am I ever, am I going to achieve, you know, enlightenment, this idea that like, okay, I, I reach enlightenment and then it all stops and I don't have anything else to learn and I don't have anywhere else to grow. Or am I okay with just endless progression? And on the company level, like, are you okay with just like never ending progress? Like that's the way that your company is always going to be just taking one step after another to a better place. I'm, I'm cool with that so long as we are enjoying the moment. As long as we enjoy the present moment, when you accept the fluidity and change of life, as all, all of us have seen evident in 2020, when you accept that things are always changing and that you're, always, you're gonna have different desires and you're gonna have different ambitions and all of these things, it's not really about achieving that particular goal. I think it's more about A, seeing the progress of, of where you started from and where you are now. And I think it's also about enjoying the moment and working together towards something better and acknowledging that it'll never be done and things will never be finished. It's like, I, one of my friends once was talking about to-do lists and they were like, they were saying, oh, you know, I mark all these things off, but I realized like, I just keep adding more things and life in some ways, I mean, this sort of sounds depressing, but I mean it in a really optimistic way. Life is a series of to-do lists. Like there's always more and different things to do. And once you accept that the list will never be crossed off, you can change the way that you look at the things that you're doing on a daily basis. Um, So that's why for me, it's exciting because it's never ending and it's always going to be new and different and new people and new characters and new lessons and new opportunities. But I think, um, you know, I was, I was listening to a book this morning. I live in Brazil, so I can't buy books. So I have to get everything from Audible. I live in this small town where there's no bookstores. Um, and the book is called 12 Rules for Living. And I think it's like rule number three or rule number four is compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to somebody else. And I think like, look, almost any, any team call we have, I will have a moment and I'll be like, yo, remember when we used to do things like whatever and then reference something of, of how, how things used to be different before and how much we've progressed since then. And, I, and like, to me, that's the game. The game, it's not about being perfect. It's not about achieving all the goals. It's A, making sure that you're present in each moment and satisfied 
and fulfilled with the work that you're doing and the progress you're making as an individual and be acknowledging how far you've come and understanding you have the capacity to accomplish so much more. Mm. And I think that might be a, a great way to experience the present uh, via reflection on how things have gotten better, the progress that you've made, like the power of, of positive reinforcement, you know, I find is, is vast. And I actually, I'll ask you this in relation to the law. I was thinking about it the other day that, you know, the way that the law is set up in a way is maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense in that it, it really only focuses on when someone does something wrong, we're going to then assess the situation and penalize them. It doesn't focus on a reward system, right? So like I, I taught children for, uh, for a while. And what I learned there is the, the power of positive reinforcement. So instead of reprimanding, focusing on when they're doing the thing that, you know, the behavior that, that you like uh, and reinforcing that behavior, tremendous outcomes from, from doing that. Any, any reflections on that, like the system of the law and that it just kind of focuses more on, on uh, you know, infractions? Yeah, the, that's, it, that's a great point. And you just even have me thinking of like how people are not rewarded for using the right types of agreements. Like how can we create a re- reward system in that? The reward is that you don't get punished or you don't get sued or you don't get an audit <laughs> by the IRS. Um, but I think the, the purpose of the law is sort of twofold. One is to set boundaries and two, to be a reflection of social change and, and policy of where society is in each day. And yeah, you're right. There's, it's not like, you know, it's like the the benefit of properly filing your taxes is that you don't get an audit and that you don't have to pay all of these penalties, which I guess it's just a perspective around how you see it. Right. You'd have to, you'd have to convince people or sell people the idea that nothing happening in and of itself is the reward. The fact that you get to conduct your business without being sued is the reward for you. So I guess it's a question of how you frame it like that, but it's a really good point. Right. I mean, there's the intrinsic reward there, but there's also the uh, intrinsic punishment too, when you do something wrong and no one knows about it, like you have to live with that yourself. And you could say like, right. Nature like takes care of that because we need to live with ourselves one way or another uh, based on what we're doing. Yeah. It's that's um, yeah. Very Dostoevsky ish. (laughs) <laughs> you know, li- living living with the guilt of knowing that you've done something wrong and how that manifests in your life, and th- I think that's a that's a, a key aspect to to human nature on a on a daily basis. So, like, why law for you? Why why become a lawyer in the first place? I um, I used to work in the NFL. I was a writer for the Oakland Raiders. I worked in media services for the Raiders, and I did some stuff in NFL. And I, I remember I got to meet the commissioner, Roger Goodell, and all these other executives. And um, what I asked all of them, I was like, what advice would you give to a 22 or 23-year-old self? I, th- I was 22 and 23 when I worked in the NFL. And all, like, honestly, eight or nine out of 10 said I would get an MBA or I'd go to law school. And, uh, and that's like, that sort of was like the impetus or the small seed in my mind of, oh, okay, all of these really successful people said to get an MBA or do law school. I think I stopped doing math when I was in grade 10, like just never put in the effort for math, not a math guy. I went to, I went traveling. I lived in South America. I lived in Asia. I lived all over the world. And I sort of came back at age 26 and all my friends were doing something. And I was like the travel bum guy. And I was like, okay, law school sort of makes sense. And, uh, and then I, I, loved, I loved law school. When I was in law school, if you, if you were to tell me that I would be a yoga lawyer or that the majority of my clients would be yoga professionals, I would never believe it. But the cool thing about it is like, it's my own sort of path of, you know, I did big law, I wore the suit, I, did, I played the whole game. I spoke robot. That's what I called it. Like when you work at a big law firm, you have to speak <laughs> robot, which means you don't actually say how you feel, but instead you, you provide the response that you think the person most wants to hear. Um, which is crippling in some, in a lot of ways. And then I was like, screw it. I love all my friends are yoga teachers and I always hang out at yoga studios and why not try to help these people and really cool things have come from that. Hmm. And you, you also helped run some yoga festivals, I think too, right? 
Yeah, I, I started a yoga festival in Ontario called Muskoka Yoga Festival. The first two years I did it with my partner, Ashley Boone. We started at, we, she and I met at a yoga festival. I had no experience in organizing events. That's a whole thing for any event organizers out there. I'd never organized an event. I'd never, I never threw a party at my parents' house. I never threw a party at college. And then suddenly it's like, oh, we're trying to bring hundreds of people to a park in, you know, in a forest in Northern Ontario to practice yoga and dance and do ecstatic dance and have cacao ceremony and, and all of these things. And she and I met at a yoga festival. We're like, oh, we both love this region, Muskoka. Why don't we give it a try? And probably the most profound and transformative experience of my life was three years of operating a yoga festival. Hmm. Do you think anyone uses um, uh, house parties that they threw, like when they're in high school on their resumes for to be a, an event organizer? Like, hey, I threw the best parties. Like, I, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> as a manager, that is something like, for, as a manager, if I saw that on a resume, I would be like, tell me about the house party. It was there, where, like, where did you source the food from? What was the vibe? Um, yeah, but it, it's funny. Like, that's the whole thing about having a career and entering, you know, I, adulthood with quotes, right? Like, you, you have all the experiences, these experiences when you're younger, but the cool thing about being an adult is you realize, oh, I can actually create anything that I want. And uh, yeah, and, and, and making a yoga festival was the, was the coolest thing that I did. It was probably the most, certainly the most challenging thing that I've ever done in my life. And now that I don't do it anymore, probably once a week, I just think, oh my God, like, thank God I don't have to do any festival related work because it's very, it's very difficult. You're dealing with a lot of people and it's not profitable. And all of it comes from a place of love and wanting to facilitate an experience for people to practice yoga, to make connections, to connect with themselves in nature. And, and the, the, the coolest thing is like, you never know what dividends that pays. Like, I don't really know all the stories of people who came to Muskogee Yoga Festival and as a result, their life changed for the better. But I hope there are a lot. And that's it. Hmm. Anything to say just in terms of kind of the state of yoga in the world now and how you feel like the popularity of it rising and maybe what direction it's going and, and do you have any concerns there and as far as the direction it's going and, and where you would like to see it go? Yoga is bigger than all of us and yoga is bigger than all of us. It has a very deep rooted history. Um, and, and for me, I think one of the most profound experiences was living in an ashram in India and doing a teacher training there and, and then traveling through India afterwards. And what I would say is yo, everyone has their own understanding of what yoga is and what, and, and I, and I believe that, deeply rooted within all of that somewhere in everyone's definition is positive change. It's either introspection, it's either mindfulness, it's awareness, it's connection with your body, it's connection with your breath, it's connection with your spirit. And I think that so long as those are the aims and, and again, and the way that everyone is consumes every type of anything in the world today through the various mediums and the way that we connect I think the more yoga, the better. That's just what I'll say. Yeah. How about men specifically? Like, it seems to me it's like, you know, slow moving in terms of the shift toward more men doing yoga, but it's consistent. I mean, no, no doubt about it. Um, from your experience, you know, what have, what have you seen in terms of more, more guys doing yoga? I, I, I haven't, I, do, I don't feel like I have too much to share in regards to that specific question. Um, obviously, I know the numbers are, are a majority of the yoga practitioners, let's say in North America, not the world, I'll be careful there, um, are female. And what I'd say is like, yeah, now it's sort of trendy, right? There's clothing companies and professional athletes that are now doing it. So it's gaining traction. But I don't think there's any inherent, I think it, it's an, a human connection to asana or pranayama or whatever it is. And I don't think it's based as much on gender. So I, I don't really have any, I can't chart 
the progress of, of where I think it will go. I've always seen it more as a general human connection to yoga than gender specific. Yeah. I like what you mentioned too, um, in regard to multiple ways of viewing what yoga means in itself. You know, I think growing up and for many of us, we see it as a, a physical exercise, right? And why I personally have gotten so connected with integral yoga is because I think integral yoga, you know, sees it more as a, a lifestyle way of life that, that yoga, you know, there's, there's various components to it. Um, and, you know, when I'm doing the dishes, that's yoga. When I'm having a conversation, that's yoga. And when I'm, you know, writing, that's yoga and, and, and all of that. How do you view that word? I think in, in a similar way, I can speak from my own experience. And I, I just want to start with sort of a small example of something that I noticed. And after I share the example, maybe it'll, it'll make sense how my perspective is that everyone has their own idea of what yoga is. Um, I found that I, I started doing hot yoga. So I loved, still love, like if I could choose, if I would, was only allowed to do one type of asana class for the rest of my life, hot yoga, I wouldn't have to think for one second. Like that, there's some amazing joy and happiness and peace that I find in doing that. But what I found was as I became more involved in the yoga community and I met different types of teachers teaching lots of, you know, Kundalini or Yin or all these different styles of yoga, they looked down upon hot yoga. And they were like, hot yoga, what's, what's that? Hot yoga, you know, that's not, a, that's not really yoga, this, that, or the other. And then I thought like, yeah, but also think about the person who, whatever, whatever impetus brought them to their mat, like that person is there for the same healing and the same love and they're getting that through, like, I don't care if they're getting it through hot yoga or, or if they're, you know, sitting in Vipassana and just sitting and breathing for, for 10 days in silence, whatever it is. So that's like, that's why to me, I think so long as it's being used as a tool for awareness and, you know, to both better oneself, which again, coming to the first thing I said, when you better oneself, you're bettering the world. Like as long as people are doing that, to me, that's yoga. Um, but in my own personal practice, I was very, very asana based for a long time. And now I'm almost exclusively pranayama. I, I do a lot of Pilates and it's like anything in life. It's, it's constantly changing where, where, where we are and, and what yoga means to me. And like at the ashram, we would do karma yoga. So, you know, we'd have to garden for an hour or clean, clean the sheds or do these sorts of things. And, and I think that was very illustrative as well, that yoga can be in any particular action, right? If someone, let's say someone's raising their voice to you and you have the ability to just like pause and breathe and be empathetic and be present in that moment. Like that also can be yoga. So, um, so yeah, in my understanding, yoga is something that's fluid. It's not fixed. It's always changing based on wherever we are that day. But I think the, the one theme that's omnipresent would be mindfulness and awareness. Hmm. Is there something for you about kind of going through the fire? I'd say, you know, you mentioned hot yoga, right? Which is, I think, often a, a pretty challenging uh, experience to go through. And then, and then you mentioned, you know, how, how challenging maybe it was to run the, uh, the yoga festival. And then going through law school, I know, is not an easy feat. So does all of that, like taking on challenges, then allow you to kind of rest and even maybe more practice your definition of yoga that you just mentioned of, of kind of being, being aware and being present in the moment. Uh, what's, what would you, how would you describe your relationship with challenges? I think challenges are, challenges are a really easy way to see progress. And so if you weren't being challenged and you were doing something, then I think you wouldn't, I'll only speak for myself in the, in the first person. I think if I, if I'm not being challenged, then I may feel like I'm not making progress. And I think that one thing that's really important to me is always progressing and, and always trying, you know, that whole question of, you know, what did I do yesterday versus who am I today? So I think, yeah, challenges is, is a, something that motivates me certainly. And I think everyone responds to that. Everyone has 
a different personality type and is motivated by different things. And it's the cool thing about challenges. It's not always innately like, oh, running 10 seconds faster is a challenge. Like the, the challenge I'm currently going through is I've stayed in the same place for almost one year, which for me is crazy, crazy. I used to be like, I've always traveling. Oh, this country, this country, that place, this place, new community, blah, blah, blah. And to me, it's, it's sometimes it's a challenge to stay in one place, but again, it, that, I think that provides more texture, uh, more perspective for life. And, um, and yeah, so I, I think in answering the question about challenge, the first thing is I would dissociate challenge from something that's necessarily like inher- like objectively difficult. And I think once you understand what your own challenges are, um, it makes it easier for, for you to follow your own compass. If, does, that, does that make sense? That I, I think so. Yeah. yeah, sorry. I, I guess to, to try to answer it succinctly, challenge is something very, very personal based on, you know, wh- wherever I've been and, and everyone has their own set of challenges. And for me, I love trying new and new things. So I'm always trying new challenges. Yeah. I like too that you, you know, you mentioned that it's not always so clear, like what a challenge is, like, you know, go, go run this amount of, uh, amount of miles, right? Like, couldn't the challenge even be in a way of like, letting go of that kind of that hold on progress. Like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get better. That type of thing. Maybe that is also uh, an aspect of maybe being hard on the self, right? Like I need to be kinder with myself and just say, you know what? I can just let go and not be as, you know, goal oriented or progress oriented too. So I I can see that as a, it's like that that's making progress in itself uh, of not focusing on making progress. (laughs) Yeah, that, that's it. And this year with my business, I had one month where like my express goal was to chill out. Yeah. I was like, yeah, just exactly. chill. July exactly. is a chill month and it's not going to be about growth and it's not going to be about these things, but like I'm going to balance my life. And to me, that was more of a challenge. How did that work out? <laughs> was that challenging? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all, actually. It's sort of like when you drop the reins, like you just, you just drop them and, and, we have systems in place. So everything continued and I got very comfortable where, where I was. And, but then also I was like, okay, cool. We're like, what are we doing here? How is, uh, moving around so much, uh, affected, you know, your relationship with other people. I've also done a lot of, a lot of moving around, lived in many different communities. And, you know, I, I was somewhat aware of, maybe just for me personally, uh, an exhaustion of forming relationships, you know, again, I mean, it's not like I prevented myself from doing it, but I did realize that there was, there was something that was happening there where, you know, I'd be invested in these relationships and then, you know, and then you'd part ways and you, you wouldn't be in the same physical location as someone. So those relationships, you know, broke apart. So any reflections on that for yourself in terms of your relationship with other people? I probably for 15 years, I tra- I just traveled. So I learned really, really early on. Maybe I was like 19 or 20 and I had like, oh, I, I was living in Sweden and I had like a best friend who was Swiss and I was just so gutted when, when we both moved away. And then like, then it like, it sort of happened that I went somewhere else and I made another great friend. And I was like, oh, to my understanding of what relationships are, part of the nature of the relationship is enjoying the time when you're together and also understanding that inevitably we'll part because in life, all of us inevitably will part. And I think that's, I'm grateful for that perspective on on relationships and that particular belief that I have on on relationships. Whereas it doesn't always have to be that, oh, we're together in order to have this relationship that it can, you know, and, and even for me, you know, all of my family's in Canada I'm living in a small Brazilian beach town, like that's sort of an island, a a total bubble. But I think that I I speak with them a lot and maybe I'm even closer with them because I'm far away than I would be if I lived down the road from them. And and I feel the same way with my best friends. Like I speak to all my best friends all the time because I'm far away. So I, I don't think, I don't think geographical proximity necessarily has to play a part. And I think it's all about how the individual looks at the nature of relationship or nature of friendship. I'm glad to hear that. Well done. 
It's good because I think it does take a certain amount of effort to, you know, when you're, you're not in physical proximity to continue investing in those relationships. Right. What, what more can I do than tell my parents that I love them? Yeah. Hop on a video call. Hey, love you guys. Thinking of you today. I don't know. Trying my best here. That's cool. To me, that's like the positive reinforcement stuff. You know, that's like, that's the good stuff. Making, making those steps, reaching out. Um, I would say that's yoga. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. Then I love yoga. Yeah. You chose uh, the name uh, Conscious Counsel for, you call it a law firm, company? Either way, yeah. why, why that name? Why Conscious Counsel? I was, at, I was in Victoria, BC, and I had uh, a client at the time was a prospective client slash friend. And she and I were chatting and I was like, yeah, well, I, I want to do law different. And this is when I was going to be a traditional law firm, brick and mortar based in one place, only working with clients from that location. And she's like, and I was like, yeah, but like, why can't we be friends? And like, why does it have to be all this formal crap? And, and you know, why can't we speak about sort of spirituality or have a different type of relationship? And she's like, yeah, it's sort of like conscious counsel. And I was like, yes. Yes, it is. Um, and, and to me, it, it made sense because, look, all of my experiences in law up to starting Conscious Counsel generated um, resentment to the system, disbelief in what we were doing, not seeing the value proposition and the services offered. And I was just like, let's do it a different way. Like what's right. Just because everyone's just because an, an industry has continually perpetuated negative stereotypes and people don't like that relationship. We can create it away. We can create it in, in a different way. And so to me, conscious counsel represents that consciousness awareness, like awareness of what was and what we can create. Hmm. And what's the journey been like for you? Like how long has it been and what have you learned on this adventure with conscious counsel? I've had a lot of fun. I've had a lot, a lot of fun. I've had a lot of fun. Look, if this is what I've learned, thank you for asking, because I don't think I ever really reflect on this. What I learned is that anyone can create anything that they set their mind to so long as they are authentically pursuing it. And the fact really, and I said this, even in this, the fact that all of my clients are yoga professionals, almost all my clients, that's like, that is a dream. There is no, there's no law firm that was doing that before. There's no lawyers who were specifically focusing on working on yoga professionals. And I was always just like, more than anything, I want to choose my clients. I want to work with awesome people. I want to be of service. I want to change the way people are interacting with the law and lawyers. And like the, the fact that we've been able to do that, our whole team together, to me, it's just representative that anyone can create anything that they want. If you can take two things like, being a lawyer and yoga, then anyone can create any two things that they want and merge them together. And that's like that to me, that's super inspiring and makes me happy and is what makes all of it so fun. Mm. So creating what we really want. You know, I, I like your point there about kind of being uh, authentic, you know, maybe coming from a place of the heart. But is that enough too? Is there a level of organization that you really need like day after day? Because, you know, I find that like motivation really comes in wa waves. Like I'll get totally lit up about this idea that, you know, feels very powerful and authentic, but to, to keep that going, to create a company, to every single day, to hire people, take steps. What, what does that take for you? What has it taken? It's, it's very challenging and I, I feel very lucky that now I'm at, I'm, at a, I'm at a very sweet spot of it all, but also you get to the sweet spot through the challenge, through the progress, through enduring. Like sometimes you have, you work with someone and it doesn't work out and afterwards you think, I'm never hiring anyone again. That was such a terrible, awful experience, but you have to persist. That's the human story, overcoming challenges, continuing to work focusing on, on, on the goal and the end goal. And I see it. I, I have a very, very dear friend of mine who's just starting his first business now. And like so much of what he's saying and what he's going through, I saw 
in my, like I see myself when I first started conscious counsel three years ago and I just tell them, I'm like, just keep going, just keep going, just keep going. And, and look, we don't want to blindly keep going. It's not like, Oh, I'm just going to do this for the sake of doing it, but you want to keep going. If it, if, if you're committed, if you can't really see yourself doing anything else. And, and the other thing that I just want to share coming back to the yoga festival is like the ability for me, when I, when Ashley and I had the idea for the yoga festival at that point, I had like 7,000 ideas and I never did one of them. I never followed through on any of them, but there was something about the yoga festival where it was like, we had an idea, we took it from ideation to execution and the response from the community was overwhelmingly positive. And after I had like that one notch, I was like, cool, I can do this. And the yoga festival, the first year of the yoga festival was the first year of conscious council. And I think that if I didn't have that support, solidification, self-belief from being able to bring a project from complete ideation all the way through, maybe conscious council wouldn't have taken off as it did. But I just had this self-belief where I was like, okay, if you've done this once, you can do this every time. Mm. Yeah. Nice. I'm so glad it happened like that for you. Thank you. And I, I just, I want to add one other thing as well, because that whole question of motivation and how do you get up every day doing it and wanting to do it in, in the yoga law book, I talk about this, about like, there has to be something at stake. And for me, I'll never forget my moment. I was like, I played on a soccer team in Vancouver. I was working at a law firm there and I told, I told the guys on the team, every, it was just a soccer team of lawyers. You can imagine how fun that was. Um, <laughs> love you, Mundi FC. I'm, I still love all those guys. But it was like very lawyery and whatever. And I told them, I was like, yeah, like I, I want to travel the world and build an online law firm. And every, everybody laughed at me. There wasn't anyone who was like, yeah, totally, you can do it. It was very like old boys club. Oh, you, where are you going to get your clients from? And blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, Ciao. Like I'm doing it. I'm gone. And, and I think whether, you know, we, when we look at these intrinsic motivations, what drives us like that, that's been a real, a really big part of it at the start was proving to myself that I could do something. And when, when you talk about waking up and, you know, if motivation comes in waves, it's like, you have to find that one thing where it's like, I'm proving to myself that I can have this dream life where I can have an occupation that's fulfilling and service laden and make a difference and also travel. And like, I wanted to show other people they could do that as well. And that's, that was always the root of the motivation and it's, it just continues. And then as you go along, you pick up different reasons about why you're motivated to keep going, but like, it has to start with something that really, really drives you where you're like, I, I refuse to right? I'll never forget. I, when I first started traveling, so the, I used now I'm based in Brazil, but the first year I did Europe and the Middle East and Asia. The second year I did South America, excluding Brazil. And then I sort of mixed all of it up in the States and, and whatever. But I remember I was boarding, a, I had a one-way ticket to Copenhagen. I was boarding a flight. This crazy idea of being a lawyer and traveling was like, is it going to work? I don't know. And I think I had like $3,000 in the bank. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to take the trip. And in a worst case scenario, I run out of money and I come back and I get a job, you know, back in Vancouver and Toronto and I'll, and I'll work as a lawyer. And I just, I refused to accept that. I was like, no, I'm not going back. I'm not going to work for a big law firm. I'm not going to speak robot. And just like, I was and like, I'm still going three years later, I'm still going. And like, that's what drives me. And when you have motivation, that's as strong as that, that I had and everyone has that inside themselves. My hope is that everyone can find and connect their own motivation that they have. But when so much is at stake, like failure is not an option. So you don't accept it. Mm -hmm. I think that there's something powerful there about looking at the worst case scenario and seeing it as opposed to maybe just like denying it and, and running away from it. Right. Like, okay, I'm going to look into that darkness. Like if this doesn't work out for whatever reason, and then I see what that darkness is. Okay. I can live with that. Yeah. I don't want it, but I can live with it, but at least I'm aware of that possibility. And then now, because I'm aware of it, 
maybe that that creates a certain sense of of ease with moving forward, which is extremely important to being able to continue on. That that's it, and I think not only is it like a, a darkness or the worst case scenario, but I think what it does is when you confront the possibility of your dream not working out, you realize you're going to be okay. Like if I had to go back to Vancouver, Toronto and be a lawyer, like it's going to be okay. I I can handle it. Everything's going to be fine. If I use my $3,000 and I don't get a single client, like I'm going to be okay. I'll figure a way, I'll figure it out. And once you have that confidence to know that even if you're not getting what you want, you're still going to be okay. That gives you more, freedom and agility to then really pursue what it is that you want. Awesome. Corey, thanks so much. Uh, really enjoyed connecting with you today. Um, can you uh, just give anyone out there some information about how to contact you potentially website? I think you're on Instagram as well, right? Anything else? Yeah, The website is it's either yoga legal.com or it's consciouscouncil.ca. The Instagram is Conscious Counsel, and the book that I wrote is called The Yoga Law Book. And my email address is Corey, C-O-R-Y, at ConsciousCounsel.ca. Send me a note. Say hi. Happy to connect with anyone. And, um, and thanks for the opportunity. I, I really am grateful for, you know, this chance to, uh, to reflect and verbalize some thoughts that otherwise would probably just be swimming around in my head. So thank you for the wonderful opportunity. Yeah, that's just the fun part, right? <laughs> uh, just kind of getting what we have going on inside and trying to verbalize it and put it out there. Uh, I think I think that's awesome. I really enjoy doing that. Cool. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Hey, did you uh, did you record uh, your own audiobook yet? We did. Yeah, we did. We're working through. I did it pri- Like we did it ourselves, and we're working with Audible. Audible is a little bit challenging, but we're working through it and, and we've recorded all of it. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, I can connect you with another platform I used uh, to record my book too, if you want. Oh, uh, cool. Please. Yeah, cool. All right, Corey, thanks so much again. Uh, really awesome. And wishing you the best of luck, man. Keep on keeping on. Cool. I will keep on keeping on. Exactly. <laughs> If you've enjoyed this content and think others might as well, please feel free to share and subscribe.